<laughs> I saw saw Lisa on there, and I said, uh, "We're missing you. You better be at church tomorrow." <laughs> That's why people don't watch me on Facebook because they're afraid I'm going <laughs> to say something to them. So, well, we are glad everybody's here, and so, uh, like I said, it is going to be our go out to eat Sunday. So, I hope all of you can do that. Uh, I did start a new series yesterday. I've got a. Uh, I've been thinking about it for quite a while. I thought I'm just going to do it. I don't know for sure what nights I'll be doing it or days, but I did it Saturday at ten this time. And I want. I think it's time we start uh, helping people. You know, you know, we wrote the book uh, Kay and I living out of our spiritual resources, and of course Kay taught that first, and then I did. Uh, so we want to live out of our spirit, but also more than out of our spirit, we want to live as spirit. You know, too many people think when they're living out of their spirit is what they can get their spirit to do for them. Uh, like Kay had said one time, too, ma- uh, too many people still come to this understanding looking for a better humanhood, you know, uh, which would imply that they don't have it, right? If you're always looking for something, then your mindset is you don't have it. If you're always looking for a healing, looking for uh, a financial blessing, whatever it is, looking for love, you know, you you uh, you're showing that in your awareness that you don't realize that you have it already. Uh, you know, like you, I could talk to uh, young couples that are out there looking for love all the time. If they could with with make a withdrawal for the love of God that's within them and be satisfied with that, then they won't go after love in all the wrong places. I don't mean to be stealing from that lyrics of that song, but that's what's happened. But we need to realize that He's the lover of our soul, which is our entire being. And if we're satisfied with that, then I hope I'm trying to say what I want to say. We won't, we won't be putting expectations on other people to satisfy us. Amen. Is that all right? Yeah. Yes, yeah. love. But if they don't love, I'm still satisfied. Yeah. I, still, I still have the love of God in me. And that keeps me from cratering and when people reject me and all that stuff. Because God's my source. God's my love. And so we want to teach people. And pray for me because I'm writing this new and I, it's in me, and I'm not worried about it at all. But uh, I want to teach people how to live as spirit. And, and I will learn that as I do it, as I go. And I believe that we need to know that because we don't want to live as carnal because Paul said to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. And so we need to be thinking every day, every moment that I'm spirit. I have, I have the mind of Christ, which is my Holy Spirit and your Holy Spirit. So we'll get back to no penal substitution, though. That's what we're going to teach on today. Uh, this, uh, this particular teaching that we've been doing the last couple of weeks is out of the third volume of no penal substitution. So hopefully I'll have that done here in about four or five months, maybe sooner. But uh, we'll never stop it. We'll just, like Kay said on this lesson... That The Old Testament, we, uh, we read scriptures that seem to say that God brought a great flood to wipe man out. We were all taught that, wasn't we? That God was upset with man, that was angry with man, so he decided he was going to kill everybody but, but Moses. I mean, but, excuse me, Noah and his family. And that's what makes people like my son and his wife when they were young read the Bible and think this just doesn't make sense and it contradicts itself because in the Old Testament it says God's mean, God's angry. In the New Testament it says God loves you. But then the religious perception of is God loves you but, and then they apply all their buts there. So when you do a surface reading of the word, it does not make sense. And when you you don't have the ability, which some people don't have the ability to look up these Greek words and Hebrew words and see what they really mean, it's very tough. But I do believe that you do. I don't believe you have to know all that. I believe you just have to know that you've got the knower inside of you. <laughs> you've got the one that spoke. You've got the one who is love inside of you. You have the Spirit of God. And a lady wrote me yesterday and wanted to know uh, how to live as Spirit. And I said, well, just keep coming with me and listen to me as we teach. But the truth is you can say, Father, I believe I'm Spirit. And I believe I, my Spirit is your Holy Spirit. And I believe that I have your mind. I don't understand it, but I believe it. So like Mary said, when the 
messenger said, you're pregnant. And she says, I don't know how, I've, I've not known no man. But she said, but be it unto me. So I just think by faith, many times we need to say, but be it unto me. And then practice uh, being still and being quiet before the Lord. Often. You know, our brains are so busy, are they not? Yes. There's just so much in this world to think about. And we're so distracted with Facebook and Twitter and, and all these other things and uh, the news media and the politics and all the stuff that's going on in the world. I, I would venture to say very few people spend a, 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 a small percentage of their time meditating on the things of God every day. Yeah. Norma, how many times did you do it a day? <laughs> no, I'm kidding you. <laughs> two, two times a day. <laughs> You know, but the, the scripture instructs us, instructs us to meditate on the Lord day and night. And like I told her, and uh, I may have mentioned it in the teaching yesterday, but no matter where you're at, what you're doing, you could be meditating on the Lord. I mean, you can be thinking on the goodness of the Lord. When you're, when you're out gardening, you can be thinking on the goodness of the Lord. And you can see all kinds of pictures of God's love and God's glory. Jesus did that everywhere he walked. He would say, consider the lilies of the field. He always was looking at things in the earth that revealed the love of God. And so we really want that to be part of our lives so we can understand when we read scripture that God did not bring a flood. Man did that. Man caused that. Man's awareness, man's perception, man not dominion. Uh, uh, on Sodom and Gomorrah. It seems that Lot's wife was turned into a pillar of salt, by, uh, salt by, by God. You know, and I was listening to somebody teaching on, uh, talking on Fox News the other day, and they were talking about how these people can be radicalized, Islamic people can be radicalized into wanting to kill people and kill Christians and all that. And this guy made this comment. He said, when you look at something long enough without blinking, he said, it turns you to stone. And I thought, wow, that picture is what Lot's wife did because she turned to look back what she longed for. She longed for that life in Sodom and Gomorrah, did she not? And literally, that's a picture. I don't, I don't honestly believe that she turned into a real pillar of salt. I just believe that. Read in 1 Samuel chapter 15, where God supposedly told Saul to kill the Amalekites. Have you ever read that? He, where, where God said, go kill these people. And he said, kill the men, kill the women, kill the, the children. We thought, well, that was just God protecting Israel or whatever. But you know what? That's not God. If God is love and God never changes, then why would that be God? But yet we, we dared to question that because after all, the pastors knew what they were talking about. They're the ones that went to cemetery school and they knew what they were talking about. Correct?
So we're not going to throw our Bibles away like a lot of people do and do away with the Old Testament. What we do is see these Old Testament stories through what Jesus revealed and through what Jesus showed to us. We should always receive the living word that is the written word in our Holy Spirit. And too many people give those that book that we call the Bible uh, the power. And we think, well, the Bible, it, of course, if they, we think all we were taught that all the Bible is inspired by God. Now we know that it's not, but we give it to the power so much so that there are denominations that will not allow you to read any Bible besides the King James Version because they think the King James Version is God's Bible. And for some reason, then they must think Jesus spoke English. I don't know, <laughs> you know. But there are, uh, do you all realize that there are hundreds of versions of the Bible? Most people don't. Most people, I have a list of a lot of them, but I have one Bible in there. It's called the Word, and it says with 26 translations. So literally 26 different translators is used in that particular Bible. Now, they don't use all those translations for every scripture. They chose the ones that they want in there, but there are hundreds of them. I had a, uh, had a friend, and I'm sure he's my still friend, uh, still my friend, but I haven't seen him in a long time, but in Tulsa, had a huge library, it's big, almost half the size of that wall, full of Bible translations. And it'd be pretty cool to have, but, but you know, so what we need to realize, the, what we, we need more than anything is we need to tap into the Word that's made flesh, the Word that's within us. Then when we read our Bibles, then we can discern properly what it's saying. So we must take what Jesus revealed as the final Word right? As the final word and not fight to believe man's false perception. I want to look in Hebrews 1, 1 through 3, if you would go there. And again, there's several people that's got on Facebook with us now. So I wanted to let you know again, if you haven't seen it, I started a series yesterday uh, titled Living as Spirit. Right, it was 10 o'clock yesterday and it's still on my Facebook page. So I would like to invite you to follow that series. I will be announcing every week what day, what evening, when it is I'm going to teach it because I can't just absolutely say it'll be every day at a certain time because I have a itinerary that I have to follow in my work. So have you found Hebrews 1, 1 through 3? Okay. The Apostle Paul wrote, God, who at various times and in sordid manners, manners spoke in times past unto the fathers by the prophets. But they, and I'm paraphrasing this, okay? So it's not going to be exactly the way your Bible says it. But he spoke in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, but they did not listen with intelligence. Would you agree with that? Because they wrote down their perception of what God said. So therefore they were not properly able to repeat or act out of what Father God said. Hath in our day of awakening spoken to us by Son, by whom he hath appointed understanding to Son, of all things by which also Father made the world without beginning or end, age after age. So basically, Paul is really sharing something people should have understood there. Of course, in the King James, it's worded a, a quite a bit different. But he was saying God spoke to the prophets, but they, they only heard with their perception. They, weren't, they wasn't listening with intelligence. And so when they wrote or when they taught, they didn't say what God said. How many, have any of you ever sat in church and listened to a preacher or somewhere and think, did God really say that? You ever question that? home. I'll never forget that story. I would have loved to seen it. I would have loved to videoed it. I think it was good, you know, and I hope, I hope she rem remembers that to this day because a bunch of stuff that religion has taught people needed to stand up and say, this is a bunch of dung. That's what Paul said after he was really apprehended and really began to understand what Jesus was really revealing to him. He said, I counted it all as dung. And that, that is the truth. So, 
When Jesus talked to the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, he began to speak in relationship of himself. He began to explain those. He went through the Psalms. He went through almost the entire Old Testament and showed them where people said this, but this is what he said. And he showed them the physical pictures. So he was saying, they said this, but I say this. He was saying in those scriptures in the Old Testament, there was some confusion. They didn't understand me, but now I'm here to show you who I am. And that's what I did on my earth walk. So we've got to realize Jesus revealed the heart and the love of Father. And much of the Old Testament was contrary to the heart and the love of the Father. I've had people say things about me in my life that was totally contrary to who I really am. One thing that hurt, has hurt me the most in most of my life in the world system and also in the church is people say stuff and I think, how can they say that about me? They don't know me. You ever thought that way? They don't know who I really am. How can you say that about me? And I just... I'll feel sorry for God. <laughs> God's okay. But I would just think God would be thinking, how can you say that about me? You don't know my love. Amen. You know, and, and he did that through Jesus when Jesus wept over Jerusalem. And he said, how, how often have I, gather, I wanted to gather you under my wings and love you? And that, that's one of the times that Jesus wept. And I believe that was God weeping through Jesus. You know, and so it is a sad situation. Uh, most of the Old Testament... And I will say religion is contrary to Father's uh, love because it's infected by mythology and paganism. To this day, a lot of religion is still infected and influenced heavily by mythology. And if you have Facebook, I hope you've seen that picture I put on there of a tree. Uh, I showed the tree with apples on it and then the trunk. And I said the trunk represents your conscious awareness. And then the roots are planted in the soil, which is are your influencers. And so if your fruit is not remaining, if it's not, if you're not, and the, the top is actually your experience. If you're not experiencing fruit that remains, then you probably should change your influences or your influencers, right? That I mean, that's just proof. If I go to uh, Markham's Nursery and I tell them I have a plant out here that is really yellow looking and it's all this way or whatever, they're going to say, bring me a sample of the soil. And I bring them a sample of soil and they check it out and they say, well, it doesn't have enough iron or it's got too much acid in it. Or there's some bugs in there eating on your on the, the roots. And so we've had a lot of bugs eating on our roots of our awareness, have we not? Yes. <laughs> Religious bugs, if you would. And so uh, people need to understand that uh, Israel's influence produced no permanent fruit. You know, look at the picture of Jesus when he went by the fig tree and there was no figs on it. And there were supposed to be figs. And he, he spoke to it to wither away. And it was a picture that he was showing us that, that the law was going to wither away because the law never produced fruit. He didn't curse Israel like we, we thought he did because it pictures Israel, but it pictures, pictured the law of Israel. And the law will never, ever produce fruit. And Jesus was here to do away with the law. And he did that for us. So we are pictured in the Bibles as trees of righteousness, yet far, far too many people are not producing the fruit of righteousness. And that's why God told Adam, you can eat from the tree of life, but don't feed from preachers and teachers who teach the knowledge of good and evil because it will produce bad fruit. It will produce withered fruit. And we need, we want, again, we want fruit that remains. I know all of you do. I'm, I'm tired of living that life where I need a healing all the time. Rod needs a healing in his body, and Rod knows that God's his health. God is his health. And so I don't want Rod just healed of this problem. I want Rod to, to rise up and, and live out of his divine health where no problem comes back at all. Amen. Right? Amen. And that can be every area, of our life, every area of our body. And then we want to cooperate with that. We want to cooperate with what God wants to do in our life. And that's by constantly making a withdrawal daily on that which brings permanence and rather than that which brings temporal mm -hmm. peace. You know, and so we, we do do that stuff, but we have a mandate on our lives and we must teach what Father's revealing to us, no matter what the religious leaders think. Uh, 
Kay had said this, and I, I'm the same way. When the Lord be, really began to reveal things to me, and I began to question what I was taught, uh, I, would, I didn't really use the term question my theology, but that's what I was doing. And I, 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 don't, I don't actually think it was us doing it. I think it was God doing it through us. God's the one that asked the questions. Have you ever known that? God asks you those questions because he's going to give you the answer. And when you hear a question about the word of God or about God or whatever, you need to, you need to sit there and sit down and say, okay, Lord, show it to me. You need to follow that lamb trail that he can explain those things. When God began to question devil to me, and when I saw fire and brimstone, I thought that doesn't make sense. You know, so I had a choice. I could have just ignored it and stayed where I was or say, I'm going to go all the way. And I have gone all the way. And I know Kay has too. And we don't want uh, to compromise what the Father has given us just to please people. I love people and I wish more people would listen and they are, but I wish more religious leaders would listen is what I wish. And I believe they will. I believe one of these days they're going to wake up. I hope it's really quick. So if the religious leaders will not let the people go, the people are letting themselves go. You know, God, uh, God sent Moses, according to Moses, and said, God said, let my people go. You know, and I, I've been hearing that for a long time. God is saying, let my people go. But a lot of religion won't. But I'm telling you, there's people all over the world that's coming out from that stuff. And I hate it for them. I never tell anybody you need to leave your church or your fellowship. But if whatever they're feeding you is not bringing any permanence of life, then you need to make an intelligent decision. Because if you don't, you're going to continue in that. So many of the people who reach out to us are not what we would call religious-minded people. And if, if you're not religious-minded, you can receive these things. I sat with a couple yesterday. I could tell the wife was listening, but the man wasn't. You know, the man heard me, but the man was a stone. You get that? He, he focused on that, what religion, it turned him into a stone or a pillar for that denomination where his wife seemed to be a little bit different. But I knew to, you know, back off of it for a little bit. But we get hundred, hundred, uh, hundreds, if not thousands of emails and messages on Facebook and calls concerning what we teach and asking for more. They want more. Kay goes to places and fellowships and teaches where sometimes the leadership there rejects what she's teaching, but the congregation mm -hmm. goes around them and requests for more information because it's the food that they need. It's the real bread and wine that Father's holding out to the church today. So religious-minded people only listen to what the religious teachers say, and they don't research Old Testament history. They don't research Christian history. You know, unless you went to a, a Bible college, I'll be nice and call it a Bible college or seminary, and took Old Testament survey and Christian beliefs and the Christian history, unless you did that, you don't really know where your beliefs came from. And very few people did that. I mean, most people barely have time to study their Bible, yet get some commentaries and other books and go through that. But we really needed to check it out. When you joined a denomination, you, needed to, you should have found out where that came from and the startings of that and the beginnings of that. And you might find out this is not what I want to connect myself to. So, you know, we both have, uh, we, we, we both, uh, Kay and I both have uh, committed our lives to this. And I know other ministers have too. I know they have. And they've committed their lives to us. And we easily understand why there are those that have a problem with it. The problem comes from what they are feeding on and again in their influencers. Turn to Isaiah 61 if you would. Five times in the Sermon on the Mount. I don't, if you've never read the Sermon on the Mount, you should read it. And read it with the love of God. But five times uh, Jesus said, they say this, but I say this. Five times he did that. And what they said was God was not God. What they said of God was not God. Right? And so I'm, I pointed this out before in the Old Testament when God was saying, you, you think you sacrificed these things to me, but you didn't. You sacrificed them to a false God. I'm paraphrasing that. But that's what he said. You think you did this to me, but that wasn't me. I, I had no desire for those things. So again, it was them and their perception of God and them lying on God. So what, what we are saying is the Old Testament prophets and leaders, when God said one thing, they heard something else. And you've already heard me talk about how you can whisper, uh, take a line of 20 or 30 people and whisper one thing in this person's ear. And by the time it gets about two or three people down, maybe even the first person 
they didn't hear the whole thing. Yeah, and, and we do that. I, I, we do that because again, our our, our uh, conscious awareness is so busy thinking about everything in the world. Don and I have a friend, kind of a relative of hers, that when he would talk to you, he would be looking at other people, and you could tell he wasn't listening to you. And I have some people that I know today that I'll be talking to them, and uh, I'm telling you, within a second, they just they'll walk off. <laughs> Or they'll get distracted and look at somebody else and they're not hearing a word that you said whatsoever. And that's what we did with our Father. And that's what we do with our Holy Spirit. When our Holy Spirit is speaking to us, many times we just go on with what we were doing. We may hear a little voice coming, but then we just go on. And and we miss out on so much. And so we don't want to because we want to hear the love of the Father. So let's look in Isaiah chapter 61 and see what Isaiah said of what Jesus said. Isaiah sometimes wrote things down that Jesus did not say when he spoke. So it says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. So the good tidings are the gospel, right? The good tidings, and we know now that the good news is the quick and raised and seated. The the crucified, died, buried is not the good news. It's not the gospel. That was the judgment of the world. Somebody, again, posted on one of my Facebook posts, and they quoted that uh, Jesus, uh, I forget how they they said it, but they were talking about how Jesus uh, took the judgment of the world, is what they said. And they were trying to prove that we were wrong. And so I went back and explained to him, it says Jesus entered into the judgment of the world, not the judgment do the world. There's a big difference, right? And the judgment of the world was what? Can any of you guys tell people what the judgment of the world was? Remember, we have a law, right? He, He must die. He declares himself to be son of God. So the judgment of the world is the societal judgment. You rock our boats, you hinder what we're doing, you need to die. We need to get you out of here. So he entered into that so he could do away with the Mosaic law and the, all, the, all the things that traduced people. So the good news is that God never left man where they were at. So then Isaiah wrote, To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn. Now, if you looked at that and you understood the love of God, would you question that last verse i mean we didn't did we because we thought that god was angry we we believed in penal substitution all that but he's sitting there talking about the good tidings unto the meek and has sent me to bind up the broken heart and and all of a sudden he come up with something negative like that and also and of the day of the vengeance of our god so we why would isaiah say that well the day of vengeance of our god uh they just thought that God was angry. They thought God was going to punish people. That was their mythological belief again, because they grew up, all of them grew up with mythological influences of other demigods, if you would, that always needed to be appeased. And if they weren't appeased, then they would enact their vengeance upon you. Just like when I talked about the god Moloch. If you were chosen to sacrifice your baby, you would have to bring that baby up there cheerfully and let them lay it on the brazen burning arms of Moloch and watch it die there. And if you showed any remorse at all for that, then that God would not accept your sacrifice and your baby would have died in vain. And guess what? That mythological system was influencing Israel at that time. Abraham came out of the Ur of Chaldees and they worshiped the God Moloch. And so that affected his mindset of God because they compared God, the Father, to all those gods that they grew up with. And so that's why I say it's affected modern-day Christianity today. Well, they teach that that, 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 vengeance of God, that day of vengeance of God is the day that God, that Jesus went to the cross. Now, that God, God was angry with us, and he poured all of his vengeance out on them. But even all through the Old Testament, all their, their laws and their rules and their sacrifices, if they didn't sacrifice this animal or they didn't do it just like this or whatever, that God punished them. And, and all through the Old Testament, they believed it was God punishing them, but it was not. They believed that the flood was God's vengeance, and it was not. So not just 
with Jesus, but literally they thought that God was always a vengeful God if you didn't obey and didn't do exactly as he told you to do. So Isaiah 61, 3, then it says to point unto them that mourn in Zion to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. So let's see what Jesus says about this. He quotes this in Luke chapter 4. So turn to Luke chapter 4 concerning this prophecy. Uh, what Jesus did not say is just as important as what Jesus did say. Does that make sense? What he did not say is just as important. So I'm going to show you here where he did not say some of the things that Isaiah said. So we find some things that the Holy Spirit inspired Isaiah to write. But when Jesus comes along and repeats what he leaves something out that was not inspired by God. It was inspired by mythological and paganistic beliefs. And so rather than listening to the Holy Spirit, uh, it was his interpretation of what God said. So Luke 4, 17. Hello, Diane Cole. Thank you. I'm getting a lot of happy birthdays. Send the presents. I'm looking for the presents. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Luke 4, 17. And there was delivered unto him the book of, of the prophet Isaiah. And when he opened the book, he found the place where it, was re- where it was written. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Same thing Isaiah said, right? He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of the sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book and he gave it again to the minister and sat down and the eyes of them were in the synagogue were fastened on him. They were mesmerized by what he said. And he began to say unto them this day in this scripture, this day, uh, excuse me, say unto them, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. The reason he did not say, and the day of the vengeance of our Lord is because he knew that they would, what they would hear is their interpretation of God. And that's what Isaiah was writing was his interpretation of God. That, venge, that vengeance was coming. And all that vengeance that was due to them would finally be exacted upon Jesus Christ. So he ended his talk this way, and he did not repeat what was said. And Isaiah said all the good things, and then Isaiah slips in this, the day of vengeance of God. And it's just like Kathy Sims, I think that's her last name, used to say, uh, what you believe comes after your, uh, what you really believe comes after your butt. So he said all this, but then he said, but he's still vengeful. He's still angry. So Jesus left it out because he knew this. And you understand people read the words like wrath, judgment, vengeance, indignation, fire, and brimstone. They read those in the King James and other versions of the Bible. They listen to preachers preach that and they believe in an angry God and they fear an angry God. They know God loves them, but if I make a mistake or if I don't do this or I don't do that, then all this is going to come upon me. And we need to be able to explain these things. You need to be able to explain these to people. Wrath is what? Orge, right? It's, it's an intimate word. It means the longing for, the reaching forth, and the love of God. Judgment is the decision, the, the, the decree, and the declaration from the foundation of the world that God said, let us become man or let us make man in our image and let them have dominion. That's what judgment is. It's a decision, and God made the decision. Vengeance is the same as wrath. Indignation is the same as wrath. Fire is the word of God. When you look at biblical tip, uh, uh, typology, fire is always the word of God. Jeremiah, and there it says, I make my messengers flames of fire. I think it's in Isaiah, God said, is not my word of fire. And then brimstone. What do, what do we know brimstone means? It, it, the root word is, uh, the first word is theion, which is sulfur, which is a cleansing agent. Then the next root word is theia, which is godliness. And the next root word is theios, which is God. So brimstone should have been translated God, right? Travelum and birth with the word of God, without your mixture, without your butts, without your dung, as Paul called it. Because your mixture, your butts, and your dungs destroy God. It, it lies on God. 
and it keeps people from having an intimate relationship with God. You know, if Donna was always afraid of me, it'd be very hard for us to have any kind of intimacy together, right? Always worried that she's going to mess up or do something wrong. And literally you see people, particularly women that are afraid of their husbands. I, I remember one time seeing a young lady and her husband uh, at a business and I looked into her face and I thought I saw terror. I thought I saw fear. It literally hurt me to see what she looked like. And probably two weeks or three weeks later, I told her I saw you at this restaurant and I said, I was very worried about you and I just want to make sure, are you okay? Because you did not look okay. And she just kind of bowed her head and said, I'm okay. I just wasn't feeling good. But I still sensed that there was something wrong. And so you see people and, and we've seen stories and pictures where women are afraid of their husbands and there is no real intimacy whatsoever there, right? So we have been raised in religion, mythologically influenced religions that really have made us be afraid of God, if we would really admit it. You know, we sang songs and we cried and we worshiped and we did all the things the church taught us to do, but still down inside of us somewhere, am I telling the truth? There was some kind of fear that I'm not pleasing God because, you know, I'm not blessed. I don't have all the money I need. I don't have the healing I need and all that. And we were taught that, you know, like the word of faith teaches that you just don't have enough faith. If you had enough faith, you wouldn't have all this. So it's always put on us and it's not about us. It's about the father's love for us. The, all the parables are about the, about the father. They're not about the lost coin or the prodigal son or any. It's all about the love of the father. Right. So people read these words and they don't understand that it's about the love. Preachers and teachers who use these words, they scare people into submission. And guess what? They're not really anointed. I've been to churches where, man, they got people crawling on their knees and coming down and repenting and saying, man, this was anointed service today. And they did it with fear. They're not anointed because the word anointed is consecrated and it means that you've seen something. Well, what do you need to see? Not the anger of God, not the wrath of God, not a false God. You need to see the love of God. Yes. In these cemetery schools, they need to be taught the love of God and people will rise up out of their, their, their death estate. If they would teach, if they would, the, the whole preface of their whole teaching needs to be the love of God. Yes. I was telling... Uh, Cecil the other day, I, I wish there was a Bible college that taught this. You don't forget the, the master's degree and this kind of degree. And I'm not, I'm not against degrees, but I'm telling you, when people need to come, go to, they say, I want to be a minister and I want to be a pastor. and I feel a calling on my life. They need to hear no penal substitution. They need to hear a message on the love of God. You know, we know you've been taught from all these different denominations, but we're going to teach you the love of God. But what do they learn? They learn the Nietzschean fathers. They learn, I mean, the list goes on and on and on, which doesn't help anybody whatsoever. I sat in the presence of men that can speak Greek, they can, I mean Hebrew, they, they, they know Greek backwards and forwards, they know the history of the church back and forward, but they don't know the love of God. I've asked a lot of people lately what they think the word grace means, and they think it means that, that God has given you what you don't deserve. That's a lie. And mercy is not God not giving you what you deserve. Grace is the very spirit of God. God graced us with his Holy Spirit when he created man. And when you were born, you were graced with the Holy Spirit of God. You got more than just being born into the Richmond family. All right? You, you, were, you were born into the kingdom of God. You were born with the kingdom of God already inside of you. And so we don't want to hear these false statements anymore. To be consecrated, it's important. You've got to see this. We, 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 I, I, I saw this this morning, but the Lord reminded me of this. But when Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, up to the mountaintop, he did that for a reason. He wanted to reveal to them what was inside of him and what was inside of them. That's what I believe. It says he, he shined, his glory shined. And I, I think he wanted to show them this picture. But I also think he wanted to show them <coughs> what was inside of them that shouldn't be because all of a sudden the glory of God began to shine upon him and Moses and Elias, Elias appeared, which represent what? The law, right? And what do they want to do? Oh, 
Jesus, let's build three tabernacles. Let's build one for Moses, one for Elias, and one for you. And we can come and learn of the law. And we can come and learn what you want. And, you know, let's build our own denomination, right? Let's have a Baptist church and a Methodist church and a Moses church and a Eliza church. And all of a sudden, a voice came out that said, This is son of me, loved. I am well pleased to be in him. Hear ye him. Boy, y'all got quiet there. Did I scare you? <laughs> That's what he said. Quit, list, quit desiring the law. Quit desiring what you're used to or what you're familiar with. Hear ye him because he's here to reveal me. I thought y'all would get excited about that. And you know what? They were fearful and they fell. That's what happened. Y'all probably got afraid right then. And they fell face to the ground and Jesus touched them and said, arise and be not afraid. Uh, I'm going to put a lot of stuff into that. Don't be afraid of God anymore. Rise up. Don't be afraid. That's what our Holy Spirit's speaking to us today. Rise up from this dust realm. Rise up from your mythological and paganistic influence perceptions of God because it's not producing fruit that remains. We all grew up, most of us, in a Pentecostal type background. It was all about slaying in the spirit and healings and miracles and all kinds of stuff. But none of that remained. I have received financial miracles. It didn't remain. I've received healing a, a couple of times. I've, I've received words of knowledge from people. And some of you can talk about some really awesome miracles that took place. But it didn't remain. I remember Margetta Houck. I've told this story many times, but one of my best friend's mothers had multiple sclerosis and it was horrible. She's in a wheelchair and, and took probably 30, 40 different pills a day. And this is not a story I heard. I've been to the home. I, was, I grew up with him for a while. And God spoke to her and said, I'm going to heal you of this. And you have to go to Brother Hibbard and have him pray for you and you will be healed. And she went to him that next Sunday morning. He didn't feel nothing, but he said... So, you know, be it unto me, we're doing it. And she was instantly healed. But all of her life, that became her testimony. And most of Brother Hibbert's life, that became one of his testimonies. Look what God did. But she died of a horrible back disease. Now, does that make sense that God would heal her of that, but yet she died of a horrible back disease and suffered terribly? No, it doesn't make sense. And we need to be questioning those things because, see, healing is not fruit that remains. Financial miracles is not fruit that remains. Fruit that remains is you don't need those things. And that's what we're striving to get to. We already have that within us, but we've got to get it in our conscious awareness where we know that we know that I I, I need more than a healing. I need a way of life. That's living as spirit or living as Holy Spirit. A lot of people are questioning me why I'm saying my Holy Spirit or your Holy Spirit because I know that there is no the Holy Spirit out there somewhere that I need to get come to come down to me. I don't know. I don't need the Holy Spirit to fall down like rain on me. But the truth of that is, is the Holy Spirit within me will rise up like rain, which is teaching. Rain's always teaching. Calm down, Roy. No, don't. don't. (laughs) Arise, quit being afraid. Why why are you afraid of God? You've been lied to. That's what we that's what we tell people. I'm telling people all the time, you've been lied to. This one guy I was talking to, he was fighting that not fighting, but he was just really defending that there really is a hell and there really are devils and this is going to take place. And I said, Well, let me ask you a question. Have you ever heard of Dante's hell? He said, Yeah, I've heard of it. And I said, did you know that Dante was a, a, a comedy writer? And he said, yeah. And that he wrote plays. And he said, yes, I know that. I said, well, then why do you believe in all this stuff? He said, well, I don't believe in purgatory and I don't believe in indulgence and I don't believe in penance and all that stuff that they taught at that time. I said, yeah, but do you believe in hell and devils? He said, yes, because there are. I said, I thought you re- knew that that was a comedy. Dante's hell was a comedy. It was a play. But yet, because he's 
been focusing on that all of his life and he stared there without blinking. You change your awareness all of a sudden. It's just like, I, I'm not sure if that is real. Because he didn't do that, then he became a stone in that belief system. And see, there are some areas in all of our lives that we may still be stones in that belief system. Right? At the brightness of his coming in your conscious awareness. So the truth, the undeceitful word, will go into and it, it's, it, it can discern what is God and what is, what is not God in your conscious awareness and destroy that and replace it with the truth. And so that's why I read scripture yesterday on this teaching on living in spirit that we need to meditate on the word day and night, not just Sunday morning. I really, I mean, I'm not trying to get you to become a five hour a day studier, but I'm telling you, there needs to be something that you're meditating on constantly yeah. and thinking about the goodness of God and the yeah. eternal yeah. love of God and yeah. who you are. You're righteous and holy and right that no weapon formed against me yeah. can prosper. Yeah. I don't deny the weapons, but I don't give the weapons power. All yeah. right. I'm not praying for you. I'm praying over you. <laughs> I'm speaking over you constantly, you know, and we're for you and not against you. And God's for you and not against you. Amen. So quit listening to what man whose breath is in his nostrils teaches. Quit listening to the accuser up here in your brain, which is your false thoughts that are not true and they're not real. So in Luke 4, 19. And he closed the book, gave it to the ministers and sat down and the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say to them, this day is the scripture revealed or fulfilled in your ears. And they were amazed at what he said, being shocked that he was only Joseph's son. That's what it said. Oh, who are you? You're just Joseph. But they were shocked. He's just only Joseph's son. They didn't even realize that he was son of God because they didn't know that they were son of God. They just saw him as a man. And there's a lot of people today, I'm not going to get on my soapbox, but there's a lot of people today that look at uh, people and think, well, that's just Roy Richmond in Oklahoma City. Who is he? I remember when I first started teaching at Brother Garner's and I had a lot of, of what I call outer court holy plate understanding. I mean, I had studied for years and I was treated in the beginning like I was just like, who are you? You know, just because my hair was combed a certain way, some of them thought I was a, a assembly God, you know. And I'm not saying everybody that way. Sandra and, and, and uh, Brother Garner treated us with great respect. I'm not saying that bad, but there were people that came there, and because I would share things that didn't go with their theology, it was like, who, who are you? And people do that all the time. Anytime you're a forerunner in something, people are going to resist what you're doing. But guess what? Just keep going. Now, this is interesting here. The meaning of the word fulfilled. He said, this day is scripture fulfilled. It, it means left nothing out. What Jesus spoke left nothing out. And it didn't add anything to it. It means to make replete. It means to finish, complete, fully preached, and filled full. There's no room for anything else. If uh, you got that cup of coffee there, Donna, and you put it in, I mean, no, I'm sorry, Lisa, and you put it in there and that filled it up to the very top, there's no room for anything else to go in there. So Jesus, what he did, he fulfilled scripture and there's no room for your religious belief system. Yeah. There's no room for anything other than the love of God. Don't make room. Don't give it a place in your life. Yeah. And see, what we've done is we've given things place in our life by staring at them without blinking, without questioning, and then it becomes a stone in our, our lives. But there is no stone that can stand against the cornerstone. Amen? Not so ever. So Jesus is completely defining the Father. He came to reveal the heart of the Father, the nature of the Father, the love of the Father, and the loving kindness of the Father, and the eternal mercy of the Father, the loving kindness, and, and His everlasting covenant. Jesus came to reveal that to us. And yet we said and we heard preachers preach it completely opposite of what it was. We heard that Jesus came to save the lost, didn't we? We came to, and we heard that if we would say a sinner's prayer that Jesus would love us. And we heard so much about Jesus, we didn't hear anything about God hardly. And that's why today people are longing for Jesus to come back. 
They just can't wait. You know, uh, I, I've, I've had somebody write on some of my posts and say, and, and I've heard other people tell other ministers, you're taking my Jesus away from you, from me. No, we're not. We're, re, we're, we're telling you what Jesus revealed and what Jesus pointed us to was Jesus pointed us to the Father. He came that we might love the Father. And I'm telling you this, and this is a bold statement to say, but I'm no different than, I mean, Jesus is no different than me, except for that he was the Messiah and he was the one that revealed, but I'm here as a messenger to point you to God. Kay's here as a messenger to point you to God. You are here as a messenger to point people to the true and the loving and the eternal God, just as Jesus was. Do you believe that? Yes. There's no difference. Jesus was a man with 100% God awareness. We may not be 100% aware, but we are here as messengers and comforter teachers to help explain and, and teach the truth of the gospel to people. Jesus came to reveal. I'm here to reveal. Aren't you here to reveal? Jesus came to disclose the Father. We're here to disclose the Father. And, and that's what's going to make us happy. So if we read in the Old Testament or hear taught religiously infected teachers and preachers, if it doesn't line up with the love of God, then what you should you do? Don't welcome it in you. And don't sit there and say amen. It's amazing how I've been to conferences. One preacher says one thing, another preacher contradicts them, and they say amen to both of them. You know what amen means? So be it. Don't say that. I heard this this morning. There's a song. Whose report are you going to believe? Are you going to believe what your, your denomination says? Are you going to believe what Matthew Henry said and all the other people that people just love and admire? Are you going to believe what they said about God or are you going to believe what God says about God? And I say this all the time. Don't go out and tell people what Pastor Roy teaches. You tell people what you know. You know, too many people have said what Roy said when it wasn't what Roy said. All right. So we are holy unto God and we should be holy unto ourselves. We should not speak a false report of our father or of ourselves. We should not be joining with restless teachers. What does that mean? People who have not entered into the rest of God. If they have not entered in the rest of God and you join yourself to them, you're not going to enter into the rest of God. If you join yourself with preachers that don't know and teachers that don't understand the eternal love of God, you will never understand the eternal love of God. Pretty bold, isn't it? So Jesus perfectly defined God's nature, character, love, and our eternal righteousness. Uh, so again, where the word vengeance was concerned, he was revealing the true nature of God and that what they thought using that word was, was influenced by, again, mythological belief systems. So rather than saying the day of the vengeance of our God, Isaiah should have written the revealing of the reaching out for and longing for love of our Father. That's what needs to be placed there. Instead of saying the vengeance of our God, he should have said the revealing of the reaching out for, longing for love of Father. That was the day of the Lord. That was when Jesus came to reveal that to man, to wake people up. So Jesus was perfectly redefining the whole Old Testament perception of God and the love of God. All right, I want to see something here. So the undeceitful word is what we need, right? Remember when it says, Jesus said, the truth will make you free. When you look up the word truth in the Greek, it says the undeceitful word. So that's what we're after. When we look at the word vengeance, we see words uh, that are kind of closely connected to wrath or whatever, but that's not what God said. I want to close with reading Luke 7:22. And then we're, next week, we're going to go read the whole chapter of Isaiah 45. So if you want to read it this week and look at it, we're going to show you some powerful things there. But at Luke 7, 22, it says, Then Jesus answering said unto them, Go your way and tell John what things you have seen and heard, how that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the dead hear, the dead are raised, to the poor the gospel is preached, and, and blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. And then we're going to look next week at Isaiah 45 and see what Isaiah said about that, contrasting what Jesus said about it. And again, I always say, if you read the Old Testament and you see something, you need to say, did Jesus say that? Did, re did Jesus reveal that? So again, what Jesus didn't say is just as powerful as what Jesus did say. Right? And I wish we would have known this a long time ago, Rod. 
it would have helped us. Yeah. It would have helped a lot of people, you know, because we were repeating things that Jesus did not say, and we were only repeating what perception said, <laughs> mythological belief system said. So God is nothing but love. Amen? And that's all God has, his thoughts of you. Is it Jeremiah where he says, I, I know my thoughts toward you. They're not thoughts of bad, but they're thoughts of good. They're thoughts of love. That's what, that's what God thinks about you. You ever had anybody ask you what, what do you think God thinks about you? About them, I mean. just explode with inside of them. All those leaders that were there and all the, the governments that were there to realize it's the love of God that constrains us. You need a political system fixed, the love of God will do that. Let the love flow through you. If you're the head of the financial industry, let the love of God flow through you. All the decisions they make are how to make them more money, right? They don't make you loans to help you. They make you loans to make them more money. They don't prescribe medicines to help you. And I'm the, the, the individual people, but I'm talking about the system. They're not giving that medicine really. They're, they're doing it because it makes lots of money. Yes. <laughs> Rod can tell you that chemo is terrible, isn't it? Yeah. It's, it's rough. There's more money made off chemo than any other drug there is. So when they do things out of love, that's when it's going to change the world. I wish I could recall her name. But there was a lady that I got to talk to on the phone, and I just loved her, and she passed away recently. But she was a nurse, and she got tired of seeing how people were suffering. She got tired of seeing how people were, were uh, receiving all that medicine and, and causing great suffering. And she quit the medical industry, and she started a place where people, that, and she only took people that were uh, uh, diagnosed with terminally ill problems. And she took them down there, and she began to reshape their belief, belief system begin to give them different influences and, and show them how to live out of who they are. And many, many people would end up cancer-free and okay. diabetes-free and you name it, all kinds of diseases, they were being free to that. You know, because she realized that's not the way. The way is the way, the truth, and life way of life, right? It's called I, uh, the highway of holiness in Isaiah 35. It says, even though you're acting like a fool, you won't err there, <laughs> you know? If, if we just, and that's what God's bringing us up to. We're on it already, right? You know, some people think I, come up higher means you need to go. No, it's come up higher in your awareness. God wants you to find out who you already are. God wants to find out who he already is. And he wants you to find, you to find out what you already have. Amen? That's the real good news. So God bless you. Thank you for being here with us today. Uh, again, uh, Sometime this week, I'll announce it on Facebook. I'll do the second lesson on living as spirit. So if you haven't heard that or watched it, I encourage you to do that. It's going to be a powerful, powerful teaching. And if people receive it and meditate on it and dwell on it, I believe it's going to help all of us to rise up more and more to living out of who we are. We are Holy Spirit. Jesus was Holy Spirit. God is Holy Spirit. I can't say it enough because people struggle with it, but God is our creator the Bible says we are of God and God is spirit, so we have to be spirit, right? So it's okay to say my Holy Spirit. My Holy Spirit speaks to me all the time. It's the voice of God, correct? And your Holy Spirit speaks to you all the time. We just need to calm ourselves down and get some of the distractions so we can hear and it'll say this is the way walk you in it. Amen? Amen? That's what I'm praying over you. 
that Rod and Sandy will hear this voice. This is the way. Walk you in it. Amen. Amen. All right. God bless you. Appreciate you. Love every one of you. Thank you for the birthday wishes. Wishes. Tim Ross. Hello, Tim Ross. My good friends watching.